Welcome uh, to, you. to you all uh, to our webinar today on global trends and opportunities in agriculture. Uh, I'm Peter Gray and I'm president of Oakland. So before we kick off with the webinar, for those of you who don't know us uh, well already, I just wanted to tell you a bit about Oakland's and our credentials in the agriculture sector. Uh, so Oakland's is the world's most experienced corporate finance advisor in the global mid-market. We've got offices in some 50 countries around the world, and collectively we complete over 400 deals a year. Uh, in agriculture, we've completed 44 deals in the last three years across a whole range of different verticals, and a high proportion of those deals were cross-border transactions, which is something we very much focus on. Uh, and indeed, uh, today we have speakers from Oakland's offices in the US, Latin America, Europe, and Africa, and that just shows you the depth of the international coverage which we can offer to our clients. Um, so my great pleasure to now hand you over to Doug Kravit, our, our Global Head of Agriculture. Doug, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Peter. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited uh, today to introduce you to some of our broader team and uh, discuss uh, uh, some of the issues that uh, we've been um, working on uh, together. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's go on to the next slide, and and uh, we'll go through the uh, the agenda uh, and uh, and and what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to start things off in the United States, uh, where I'll um, uh, talk about some of the trends in both uh, conventional and uh, the organic um, agriculture markets. Um, then we'll kick it over to my colleague, Frank, uh, in the Netherlands, um, where he'll uh, uh, talk about uh, trends um, in uh, the horticulture sector. Um, Alejandro Dillon, who's, who's reporting from Buenos Aires, is, uh, will give his perspective on uh, Latin American markets. Um, our next two speakers um, are going to talk about financing. Uh, we have uh, Russ Tolander and uh, uh, Bas Stotzer uh, from Dallas, Texas, and uh, from the Netherlands, respectively. Russ is going to talk about SPACs and uh, how they're being used for food and ag business. And uh, the uh, the and and Boss is going to um, uh, talk about um, the European debt markets. And finally, we have uh, Zineb who is joining us from Morocco, and she will lead us through an interesting discussion about the uh, growth that's occurring in Africa. So I'm going to to run through quickly. Uh, three uh, broad topics today, and uh, those are the growth in conventional agriculture markets as compared to the organic markets, uh, some of the uh, trends that we're seeing in M&A transactions in the organic and uh, agriculture, organic and sustainable agriculture sector, and, uh, and then some of the things that we're seeing that make a company attractive in today's uh, business environment. So if we can go to the next slide. So you can't talk about uh, con uh, agriculture in the U.S. without talking about conventional agriculture. And of course, conventional agriculture is uh, cyclical in nature. And the the major issue was the downturn uh, that happened from 2015 to 2019. You can see that on the in the graph that's on the uh, on the left side of the page there. Um, for, from a broad based view, uh, 2020 was an extremely volatile year. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, uh, uh, upended the market in the spring and the summer, and then in the U.S. in the back half of the year. Uh, government programs provided support to farmers, and uh, that caused many commodities to uh, to rebound. Um, as a result, you've got farm incomes that are up again, at least expected in 2020. So overall, the uh, that the outlook uh, is is still uncertain, but but from what we're seeing, we think that the market on the conventional side is going to uh, settle above the 2015 to 19 levels. Um, 
If you compare that on the right side of the page to the organic markets, organic markets have been growing between 5 and 10% a year. They've crossed the $100 billion um, annual revenue um, threshold. Um, and they were extremely resilient during the uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, now, I, I will say, um, based on conversations that we've had with farm uh, farmland owners and operators, that uh, that they're trying to keep up with the demand for the um, for, for the organic crops. Um, but they're they're a bit cautious, and the conversation usually goes something like, uh, "It takes three years to jump through all the hoops that are required to grow certified organic crops. Um, once you get over the hump, the preferred price it, that's realized is is generally worth the switch." Um, but, and this is a big but. There's still issues related to volatility uh, related to organic crops. Um, and what this is causing is many large uh, farmland owners and operators to play in both markets. Uh, let's go ahead and flip the page and talk about uh, the M&A uh, trends in, in this market. And I'm gonna run through this quickly, uh, happy to answer questions at the, at the end if you, if you have them. You can see the run up on the left side of the page in M&A volume going through 2019, uh, decreased in 2020, uh, as expected due to the pandemic. Uh, there was a, a lack of deals that, that were done early in the year and then friction related to deals uh, later in the year um, when it was difficult to schedule meetings uh, to, to do due diligence and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but, but we expect that the total volume of M&A transactions in organic and sustainable agriculture will, um, will uh, recover to record the, the record 2019 levels and resume growth um, you know, here next year. Um, so uh, let's... Um, Let's move on to the next slide. And uh, this I thought would be uh, interesting uh, to share with everyone. And this is just what we're seeing as far as attractive businesses um, from uh, our conversations with both financial investors and corporations in the industry. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think about where do you start, uh, high value crops, um, and a portfolio of crops is, is ideal, but if you think avocados, asparagus, uh, uh, berries, those kinds of things are the, um, are, are the most uh, attractive. Uh, and also firms that can control the supply chain. Uh, if they have a strong management team, if they, they own or have farmland under long-term contracts, if they have sophisticated growing practice, um, and importantly, if they have a large enough volume and scale so that they can really make a difference with um, institutional like supermarket type, uh, type buyers, including counter seasonal type, uh, type crop cycles, which uh, you know, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Alejandro um, is going to address uh, uh, in, in the uh, Latin American part of the discussion um, today. So, um, so, so that's one example of, uh, of attractive type companies um, that are being sought after by both financial and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, corporate buyers. And with that, I'm going to uh, uh, kick it over to uh, my colleague, Frank DeHeck, who is our, um, our, our global um, uh, specialist and leader of our uh, specialty group uh, in horticulture. Yes, thank you, uh, Doc, for, uh, for the introduction. Yeah, so important indeed to mention is that uh, the uh, agriculture group of Oakland's consists of many people worldwide and a lot of us are specializing in a, a certain sub-segment. And I'm uh, specializing in the horticulture sector, so basically indoor farming. Um, and yeah, basically if, if we do a deal anywhere in the world, 
uh, with our organization, uh, I'm involved. And that really gives me a global perspective on deals. So not surprisingly, I will be talking about the uh, uh, M&A trends in the horticulture uh, sector. So if you could please go on to the next slide. Um, and I'll, I have divided my presentation in, in three blocks. So first of all, I'll be discussing very briefly uh, the market consolidation drivers in the uh, sector. Um, following up with the factors that the outside factors that are strengthening this market consolidation and third of all what the impact is on the m a activity so if we go on to the next slide um we see that the horticultural market is is changing uh, uh a lot um and yeah first of all uh, here on the left side some of the factors why the market is is changing um, market is growing, uh, horticulture market is really growing uh, rapidly. Uh, we also see that uh, uh, the technology in, in uh, indoor uh, farming is, is increasing at a, at a rapid uh, pace, uh, making product complexity uh, yeah, more of a challenge, uh, increasing uh, the cost of, of building these, uh, these greenhouses. Um, we see greenhouse being built for new crops. We see uh, much more government uh, influence of, of more decentralized uh, production. Um, on the operation side, uh, regulation will get stricter. Sustainability uh, is getting uh, more important. Um, and overall, the uh, professionalism in the sector uh, yeah, is increasing a lot. So, uh, and these factors are really important uh, for the consolidation. So uh, we have uh, here included some of the, the factors what we think the greenhouse sector uh, will look like. And a lot of the market players have this uh, on their radar. So if you go to the next page, uh, it's, it's the question of which parties will be benefiting uh, most from these trends. Huh? Uh, and what competences should you have to be a, a successful player in 2030? And on the left side here are a few of the characteristics which players uh, should have. And that, of course, that doesn't apply to all of the subcategories uh, within horticulture, but in general, they do. So uh, in general, we, we believe that the players in the high-end segment are, are well positioned uh, to benefit from the market growth. Same uh, applies to the ones owning intellectual property. You need to have best-in-class uh, services. Um, uh, need to be institutionalized. And, and the question is, which parties are well positioned to have these characteristics. And uh, basically it's not rocket science. Uh, the, the horticulture sector is lagging behind on several on other industries. So what you see in other industries is similar trends and we now see them in horticulture. And what you see in the other industries is that top three players generally have the best capabilities to score well on, on these points uh, because uh, yeah, these three, top three players can really benefit from economies of scale. So that really drives consolidation. Parties want to be the number, uh, at least the top three uh, players. So if we go on to the next one, I will skip that one uh, because the time will go on to the next one. Um, so th those are the factors that we I just discussed that trigger a consolidation from the inside. From the outside, um, people see really that the market is growing strongly and that attracts uh, strategic players as well as financial players. So if we go to the to the next one, um, we'll go on to the next one as well. Uh, we see lots of private equity, but also strategic parties uh, trying to benefit from this strong market growth, acquiring companies and performing and buy and build. That's really what triggering what's triggering the deconsolidation from uh, outside the sector. And if we go on to the next slide, we see uh, the number of horticulture these in the past years, and you see. It's strongly decreasing every year, even in the COVID year. Uh, last year, our general uh, deal flow dropped by 30%. And that's uh, a trend, uh, if we go on to the next slide, that we expect to continue. Um, the COVID pandemic has only seen, uh, shown that uh, 
the reason for colonization, so consolidation is further growing. Strategic as well as other uh, players are really trying to benefit from uh, the market growth. Um, and it will remain an in interesting market. So the number of deals will increase. So we're happy that uh, I'm happy that I'm specialized in this uh, sub segment. Uh, so I would like to give the word uh, to my colleague Alejandro, uh, who's heading our uh, efforts in uh, Latin America. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much, uh, Doug and Frank. Uh, as I was presenting, I, I'm the Vice President of Oakley's uh, LATAM and also a senior partner at uh, Oakley's Argentina. If we move forward, uh, clearly, as was said, uh, Oakley's is a global institution where I would say that agriculture is a key industry where in our monthly calls, LATAM monthly calls, we, we always have uh, transactions and themes about agriculture. I will divide my presentation in three parts. First, an overview of the LATAM market, specifically by the main countries, then the principal players in agri-investment and representative open steel cases in LATAM in this sector. If we go to the next one, clearly, as you can see, I, I think that the, the market is uh, divided in, 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 in two broad segments. I would say the uh, fresh uh, market that is uh, led by Chile, Peru, and Mexico, going <clears throat> directly to, to, to Chile, where uh, we have, I would say, together agriculture uh, and civil culture is 3.2 percent of the Chilean GDP. Where the salmon market clearly, Chile is a global player leading uh, this industry, and also we include the forestry, where Chile also is a leading player with very good return on investment. Going to Peru, Peru has a, a strong demand from both Europe and, 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 and the states, and very attractive. Uh, taxation labor assumption benefits that especially uh, boost the the superfoods like avocados and um, blueberries in mexico also the fresh fruit uh, has been uh, growing faster than the overall economy you can see the car in agricultural production uh, above uh, 8% and also in exports 6% where bananas and avocados are the clear leaders. Uh, then you have uh, in South America, the, the two main players in LATAM that are uh, global players, that is Brazil, that is clearly the fourth uh, producer of food with 20% of Brazilian GDP represented by this sector, and also Argentina that has 26 billion agricultural exports up of 60% of the total exports in commodity fertilizer, seeds, animal nutrition, and forestry. And my, uh, we have to 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 highlight that uh, uh, almost in by the end of uh, uh, of uh, and beginning of uh, 2019, Bioceres launched a SPAC of around $110 million that is going to be tackled by my friend uh, Russ in, in the next presentation. If we move to the, the, to the following, uh, here we have uh, that uh, Argentina is clearly a world player in soybeans, in soybean oils and sunflower with a important participation also in corn and uh, wheat. And as you can see, in, in also in fertilizers, is Argentina the sixth country in terms of arable land with 39 billion hectares. And with a very important uh, M&A activity in agriculture, where you can see that uh, Bioceres acquire a uh, Chemotecnica and Rizobacter, 2017-2018, respectively. Los Globo, that was uh, uh, acquired, Agrofina, and then was acquired, Los Globo, by the private equity group, uh, Victoria Capital, a couple of years ago. And the Asian giant, Sumitomo Chemical, uh, bought uh, 
new farm. And also in animal forestry is a very good uh, activity. We have seen a lot of activity in Argentina and in animal nutrition, where you can see that Argentina is the sex six animal uh, population in the world. If we move forward to, to the Brazilian one, but as I have said, are the two key markets in LATAM. Uh, Brazil is clearly a world uh, player, not only in agriculture, but also in food producer. As you can see, it's number one in the world in coffee, orange, and, and sugar. Number two in soybean, ethanol, uh, and beef. And number three in chicken and corn where you can also have 10 uh, million hectares that uh, can enter into production. The two main, uh, main states are Sao Paulo and Mato Grosso area that are very close to uh, the Pampa Húmeda of Argentina and uh, the Uruguayan Mesopotamia. Going to the next one, where we can see uh, there uh, 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 a lot of activity of global and regional players in agri-investment. Uh, on the left uh, upper side, you can see Bayer, Bas, uh, Bioceres, SLS, Vale from Brazil, Don Mario, Molinos, Los Grobo, uh, Singenta, Nidera from Kofco, ADECO. ADECO is a very good example that made an, an, an IPO also a couple of years ago uh, and first received an investment from uh, the, the PGGM pension fund, and in the last year has a, a growth their share of above 150. In fertilizers, also you have a lot of activity, and in terms of commodity players, you will have the, all the, the, the important ones: uh, Cargill, Bungi, Kofco, uh, Byzantine. Uh, well, you, you name it. And in private equity, as you can see, uh, BTG Pactual from Brazil uh, is very active. Also, as we have said, Victoria Capital, Advent, Rohatim from the, from the US, uh, from Canada, CPC, from Europe, PGGM, and also Harvard uh, Management Company participating. If we can highlight in the next, um, in the next one, uh, transactions where we participated in, in the last year. The most important one, our uh, partners at uh, La Reina in Chile made a land market transaction of $921 million, 11.3 times EBDA. They sold uh, Australis to the uh, Chinese giant Joybio in two uh, steps. Uh, if we move forward to the next one, uh, here we in Argentina, we and in Uruguay, we execute a couple of uh, forestry transactions. The most important one was the largest one uh, a year ago or so. To uh, we sold um, a forestry asset from the Rojati Asset Management Group to UPM. UPM is one of the largest uh, uh, European global part players. They have around uh, 6.8, uh, eight, sorry, 8.6 billion euros or, or say. And you can see in at the end, in our credentials, we have been doing uh, LATAM transactions for the last uh, five years above between 15 and 20. So I pass the ball to my friend, Russ Tolander from MD from, from Optimist Dallas, he, he, he will follow the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, it's good to follow Frank and uh, Alejandro because some of their talking points dovetail nicely with my presentation. Um, I'm Russ Tolander with beyond my M&A work here. I'm a 30-year uh, veteran of the U.S. public markets with a uh, former focus on small cap equities, including IPOs. Today, I will be speaking on US listed SPAC mergers and traditional IPO activity impacting agriculture and food here on the US public exchanges, and then some implications for private companies considering M&A in these segments. Um, I'll explain why SPAC IPO activity has cooled off here in Q2 of 2021. I'll differentiate between business models and uh, valuation metrics. Um, and I'll consider a couple of alternative economic scenarios going forward. Uh, in preparing for this uh, 
uh, presentation, our biggest takeaway is as follows. About six, to, well, we estimate about six to seven billion uh, per year of public SPAC merger and traditional IPO funds are flowing into agri-food right now, roughly uh, equally split between those two categories. Um, however, we point out that this amount is only about 25% of the amount of earlier stage venture capital and uh, private growth equity investment that went into uh, private agri-food tech in, uh, in 2020. So uh, we can expect more public activity or strategic acquisitions in the future as these uh, earlier stage investors seek eventual exits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the two charts on the left show SPAC vehicle uh, IPO activity over five years with an average deal size of about 320 million in the most recent years. Uh, currently, there are about 420 of these companies representing uh, 130 billion in direct proceeds sitting in trust accounts seeking merger targets over the next two years. Uh, if you upsize that with pipe investment and uh, equity rollover from tar target companies, this could represent a half trillion of uh, future uh, merger transaction value. Uh, the two charts on the right really explain uh, uh, partially why uh, SPAC new issue activity has sputtered lately. Uh, intermediate term interest rates have risen and caused a rotation out of aggressive and disruptive growth stocks and into uh, more cyclical value sectors year to date. Um, in the last week or two, that, that might be changing, but uh, let's wait and see. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in, the, in the box at the upper right-hand corner, you'll note the uh, representative SPAC and IPO aftermarket ETFs uh, have significantly underperformed uh, major U.S. indices year-to-date, and that's as of the, uh, the June 15th cutoff for our study. And the table on the left uh, presents our bottom-up work and shows SPAC mergers and traditional IPOs across agri-food groups over 12 to 18 months. Uh, we may have missed a deal or two, but we're comfortable we've uh, captured the, the essence of this market. And already I, I realized that I left out the recently closed uh, vintage wine estates deal, a uh, $700 million deal that uh, I think began trading uh, under its new symbol uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Within the table, you'll see several uh, types of companies, uh, a couple of ag inf infrastructure companies in indoor and vertical farming, uh, a cell biology uh, technology platform company, uh, several alternative protein and plant-based food companies. Uh, most of this group are higher price to revenue, uh, valued companies uh, pursuing disruptive or aggressive growth strategies and opportunities. Uh, there's a smaller subset of more conservatively valued companies uh, seek or you know showing uh, stable cash flows. This group includes food ingredient companies and traditional grower packers uh, such as Whole Earth or Mission Produce, and uh, you can throw uh, vintage wines into that group as well. And that group has uh, been relatively stable and positive year to date. Um, we included one company in this uh, chart uh, that Alejandro referred to earlier. It's uh, not a from the last year or two, but it's from uh, late uh, 2018. Um, and that's a, a beer series uh, crop solutions from Argentina. Uh, they came public by a SPAC merger in, in late 18 after failing uh, to raise cap uh, capital versus the traditional IPO route. Uh, they raised their, uh, their, their capital via SPAC. They, they delivered on fundamentals and in recent, uh, in, in recent periods, their stock price is appreciated uh, accordingly. And I'll say the, uh, the SPAC merger market and the IPO market will need more successful uh, fundamental successes from, from the other companies on this uh, chart to, uh, uh, to, to keep this source of equity uh, exit capital available. On the bottom of the page, we compare the uh, SPAC merger volumes to the venture volumes mentioned earlier and to some other reference points. I think it's interesting that the uh, top six global crop input uh, produ providers plus uh, equipment maker John Deere collectively invest about 8 billion a year into uh, R&D. Uh, that's about in line with our estimated agri-food SPAC merger and IPO volumes for the last year. Slide four, please. 
Well, here uh, we lay out uh, two future economic or interest rate scenarios that might impact agri-food companies differently going forwards. Uh, the left column uh, considers stable or lower interest rates with continued central bank accommodation leading to uh, continued risk taking. Uh, this will favor disruptive growth situations. And under this scenario, we might expect more SPAC mergers and traditional IPOs going forward. Uh, we could envision several situations coming public. Uh, robotic or AI-based harvesting companies, precision crop input application companies, uh, additional infrastructure companies and indoor vertical farming, uh, plant-based food processors or CPG uh, companies in that space, uh, maybe even an ag-focused uh, carbon sequestration uh, uh, platform company. You know, the right column considers a, uh, a different environment, an increasing interest rate environment with higher inflation, less accommodation. That would favor uh, more cyclical uh, traditional ag participants, such as equipment manufacturers, uh, crop input providers, grower packers, uh, and ingredient companies. You know, these would be more of the buy and build uh, PE type strategies uh, that generate more stable cash flow already. Um, I'm going to leave it to uh, each of you as a participant to uh, to ad adopt or adapt uh, which scenario you think uh, plays out. Overall, we think that the larger, earlier stage venture investments that we referenced will one day seek exits through the public markets or through strategic acquisitions, and that process will be enhanced by fundamental successes uh, by companies like Eosiris. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Boz Stetzer, our debt advisory specialist at Oakland's in the Netherlands. Yes, thank you, Russ. Good afternoon, all. Indeed, my name is Bas Toetser. I'm heading the debt advisory team of the Netherlands. Um, the next few minutes, I'll give you a brief update on the debt market developments we see in Europe. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, some key observations from our side. We see in general lenders are showing more appetite as the impact of COVID-19 is weakening. What we see is that pricing and leverage are back at the pre-COVID-19 levels. We see also a fierce competition between, uh, between lenders. That's, that counts both for banks, but also for, for debt funds. Uh, we see an increasing number of listed specs, especially here in Amsterdam. And what we see is that the number of restructurings is still limited. And what we also see is a trend towards um, more ESG-linked transactions. So if we can go to the next slide, please. What you see is that Amsterdam's Euronext Stocks Exchange is fast becoming Europe's prime spot for, for specs. Um, the flexible listing rules in Amsterdam are uh, quite interesting for, for, for issuing specs here in Amsterdam. Some examples, if you compare that, for example, to, um, to the US, to the previous information from, uh, from Russ, you see that the average number of, of specs is increasing. We also see that the average amount of spec is increasing. Here you see some recent examples of, of announcements or listing. Uh, and we expect that for this year, that the number of specs will, uh, will increase uh, while we see a lot of uh, demand from institutional investors. We now see that the various benefits can also be interesting to them, which spec can offer to them. So uh, interesting market segment. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at the role of alternative lenders here in, in, in Europe, it's increasing rapidly, if, especially if you compare that to the US. What we see is that the alternative lenders are also widening their mandate. What we see is that we see, uh, there are more and more parties focusing on stretch senior structures with first out and second out structures. If you compare that to the plain vanilla unitrange instruments, uh, not only the number of alternative lenders is increasing, but also the size of funds raised by them. I have uh, put on this slide some examples. So the amounts per, per, per party are increasing rapidly. As you can see, there's a lot of capital available in the, in the debt market as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, if you look at the number of restructurings and defaults, it's still currently at a very low level. This is indeed confirmed by the discussions we have with all kinds of financial institutions around this. What we see is that the banks increase their capacity on the high-risk departments, but what we see is that the inflow is still very limited. And the main question is, I think, is, is this going to change over the next few months or not? What we see is that the economic growth is picking up. We see unemployment rates are still re relatively low. 
And what we see that people have a lot of uh, amounts under cash savings. And what we see, for example, in the Netherlands, the result of that, that the uh, housing prices are at an all time high level. And for example, this month, uh, the prices went up with 13, 1, 3% if you compare that to last year. So in the middle of a crisis, we see all kinds of uh, yeah, very, very, very funny developments. If we go to the, to the next slide, uh, um, some words on ESG, environmental, social, and governance. What we see is an increasing number of new deals being ESG linked. Um, this is to encourage borrowers to improve their ESG performance. But we see that they are usually linked to ESG uh, ratchets on the margins. Um, KPIs involved, such as waste, energy use, and providing employment opportunities for people with a disadvantage. And I think it has to be made clear that it is definitely not the same as green bonds or green loans. Uh, EEG links, uh, link loans are uh, different if you compare the criteria on the application of the funds, if you compare these to the green bonds. What we see is that compliance is generally measured by an independent third party. And what we expect is that this trend uh, to become the new norm. Um, we see a lot of examples of EEG loans now, in uh, both for leveraged buyouts, but also for corporate straightforward corporate loans. Um, so it's an, ex an incentive bill uh, that definitely will continue for the next few years. Um, thank you for now. And I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Zineb. She's partner at Opens Morocco. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you both for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, I'm Dineb Shaoni and I'm a uh, partner uh, working as part of the uh, Oculus teams uh, based in uh, Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, so I will be covering the uh, agriculture uh, trends uh, in Africa. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so let's start with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so for uh, many countries across Africa, uh, agriculture remains uh, one of the most important sectors of the economy. Uh, the sector accounts for 14% of the total GDP in sub-Saharan Africa, and a majority of the continent's population is employed in, in the sector. Uh, in terms of crops, production is mostly oriented uh, towards uh, cereals, uh, roots, and tubers, uh, well, which are mainly the, the destined to local consumption. Uh, on the other hand, uh, export crops are important sources uh, of foreign exchange for every country on the continent. So we count uh, as Africa's top agricultural uh, exports, uh, cocoa beans, uh, cashew nuts, tobacco, coffee, oranges, cotton and sesame seeds, um, and many others. Uh, now, in terms of uh, financing and as uh, global food demands continue to rise, uh, investments requirements are estimated at uh, around uh, $80 billion uh, every year. Uh, well, uh, there is some difficulty accessing capital, and it is one of the major challenges faced by uh, agribusinesses across Africa. Uh, commercial loans are expensive, and uh, most businesses operating in the sector are SMEs with uh, very little collateral. Uh, just to give you an example, if we uh, if we take uh, Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria, the proportion of bank loans going to the agriculture sector uh, was equivalent to four percent of total loan disbursement in 2018. Um, adding to that, uh, estimates show that uh, only 10 percent of African households in rural areas are connected to uh, formal financial institutions. So as a consequence, the development of innovations uh, such as microfinance, uh, mobile banking have uh, provided to a certain extent, of course, uh, better opportunities to boost uh, African farmers' access to loans. Uh, alternative force forms of financing, uh, including private equity, uh, have become actually a growing source of funding for agribusinesses. Uh, so, for example, in the last decade, uh, we have more than 240 agriculture-related deals in Africa that have been closed, uh, raising around $600 million uh, from different types of entities like foundations, banks, NGOs, business angels, and other types of investors, uh, of which uh, around 20% uh, have been financed by uh, private equity firms. 
And more than 50% are concentrated in Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, as you can see from the map. So as a conclusion, uh, Africa is actually considered as a promising land for players and investors who are uh, interested in uh, diversifying uh, their sourcing and uh, looking for uh, growing markets. So now let's uh, focus on uh, Morocco. So the agriculture sector in Morocco uh, employs around 40% of the population and accounts for 14% of the country's GDP, uh, same as in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in terms of production, as you can see, the upstream is uh, diverse and serves the local market mostly with uh, cereals, sugar, potatoes, onion, tomatoes, etc. While the most exported crops are historically fish, uh, tomatoes, uh, citrus fruits, and more recently, uh, red fruits that have almost uh, tripled in value in the past five years. Uh, this dynamic has translated into a, a strong interest uh, from foreign players and investors, especially in red fruits, uh, where uh, the harvest seasons uh, in Morocco are complementary to Europe and uh, the Americas and uh, where we have the higher uh, added value. So in terms of uh, financing and investments, uh, there is a strong interest from investors and PE firms uh, as the Moroccan uh, market enjoys a strategic geographic uh, location near to Europe and an ideal uh, climate conditions for uh, agriculture. Uh, but actually, one of the uh, bottlenecks uh, for m uh, deals is actually the local legislation, which uh, restricts ownership of land to investors of uh, Moroccan nationality and therefore prohibits uh, for foreign investors from owning the land. Well, uh, this constraint is, has been partially bypassed uh, actually by the launch of a public initiative uh, aimed at uh, making uh, public land available for uh, long-term rental. Uh, as a result, we have seen in the last decade a certain number of financing uh, carried out uh, on the Moroccan soil. Uh, we can name uh, many of them. So uh, let's talk about, for example, the Spanish players, uh, Rigodar and Natberry and the red fruits uh, cultivation. We have some investors from uh, the Middle East, uh, such as Aldara uh, in fruits and vegetables. Um, we have many uh, DFIs uh, like uh, EIB and IFC who have financed uh, Moroccan agriculture and agri-food groups such as uh, uh, Diana Holding and Zalar. Uh, more recently, we have, uh, we have seen uh, large transactions uh, in the irrigation uh, system sector uh, with uh, DPI and African Invest uh, PE firms investing in CMGP and CAS companies. Uh, we also uh, uh, witnessed Sana Africa participating to the financing of uh, Palmagri Red Fruits uh, subsidiary. We can also mention Olam, Wilmar, which are Singaporean uh, players, Misui, the Japanese conglomerate. We have Avril, Castel, Bell, Agrial, which are French companies. Uh, Savina, which is a PE back Portuguese olive oil player. Well, the list is, is, is large. Uh, we can still, uh, there are other names, uh, of course. Uh, just to conclude, uh, so with its uh, large available arable land, uh, Morocco is expected to continue to interest foreign groups eager to diversify their supply of raw materials and also processed uh, materials more recently and to ensure the food security on their domestic uh, markets. And with that, I pass on to Do Kravitz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zineb. So, uh, and thank you everyone who's, uh, who's listening in um, to, the, uh, to the presentation today. Um, we uh, obviously we enjoy working in the agricultural markets, and we have a bunch of expertise uh, um, doing a wide variety of, uh, of transactions, uh, including M&A, um, uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and uh, financing. So we've left a little bit of time uh, to answer any questions that um, anyone has. There's a question that came in. Uh, do we have uh, our thoughts related to um, artificial intelligence and um, and agriculture? 
and uh, I'll start, and uh, we'll we'll let the rest of the team uh, chime in with uh, with their thoughts. So, uh, it, agriculture technology uh, has been a uh, just a, a driving force, a uh, force of nature. Uh, pardon the pun um, in the agricultural markets, um, and and it's moved. Uh, to where artificial intelligence is is a, a critical part of it, um, and so that this goes um, through uh, not just uh, in field uh, technologies, but really pervades um, and will pervade most of the technology that, that that's used in the industry um, in the coming decades. So, um, so I, I do see it as a as a major. Um, it's going to be a major influence. Um, does, does does anyone else want to want to add to that um, uh, in a little bit with a little bit of color? Yeah, Doug. Yeah, it's a this Frank. This is a big topic in in horticulture, um, where had the, the the dot on the horizon for many players is that you will get uh, uh, indoor farming facilities where the lights are off. So basically, where uh, robotics uh, take care of everything uh, based on law artificial intelligence and we see also lots of uh, lots of in, uh, initiatives uh, uh, taking place lots of uh, venture capital stepping in so uh, yeah it, I believe uh, that it's going to be major yeah well good let's move on to the to the next one I think Frank you, you might be able to address this one also um, what's What's our view on uh, vertical farming investments? Um, and uh, uh, Cristiano has uh, uh, observed that there are a number of club deals that, that are investing in the space. Um, yeah, I think you have to split those in, in, in two uh, groups. First of all, you have the technology providers on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have the uh, yeah, basically the growing facility. I, I think these are two distinct um, categories. Um, I think that uh, what, the trend that we've seen the last couple of years in vertical farming will continue and that there will become new technology, the facilities uh, will become cheaper as like, again, we see in, in many other industries um if it's going that rapidly as as many uh parties thinks i doubt but in the end uh, uh it will increase uh i th i think in market uh, in market share uh but investors would have to um yeah take into account that cost prices of new facilities will go down and yeah if you have an older facility which has cost significantly more, you, you have to compete against those. So, well, well, good. Okay, the, the next question that, that's come in, which is uh, really interesting from, uh, from Enrico, uh, was about the current agriculture cycle. And uh, he, he observes that there's a strong up cycle um, in crop prices and um, ag machines and, and uh, uh, just general M&A. Uh, and and what are our thoughts um, about this cycle, and, and how long do we expect it to to continue? Um, and so I, I look at uh, and again I'll start, and we can we can get everyone to chime in if they uh, if they have other thoughts. Uh, my my thought on on this is that there's really two two things to look at uh, the, the the short term view and the and the longer term view. Um, and so, in the in the short term, uh, it it really is driven um, crop by crop um, and market by market. Um, ge geographic markets are, are are different. So the 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 M and A cycle that's in Latin America is different than the M and A cycle that's in the the United States, which is different than in than in Africa. Um, so um, what I would what I would suggest is that um, is that we um, we see that that there's going to be um, continuing demand for select crops, high value crops, 
and and multiple should be should be stable on on those moving forward. Um, th- does anyone else have any thoughts they want to um, to add to that? All right. Um, so uh, moving moving forward, um, I, I saw um, in the questions, uh, Russ, there, there was a couple of questions about SPACs and and uh, uh, maybe the some of the the uh, what the future is going to to, to hold with uh, with SPACs. Um, do you want to address that for the whole group? Yeah, I think one of the I don't want to speak to any one situation, so I'll pass on one question. But uh, I will talk about platforms versus tuck-ins as far as the SPACs. You know, with the average deal size in the uh, you know most of the vehicles that are open around three hundred million, I think you have to consider a platform vehicle target. You know, enterprise value anywhere from you know minimum three hundred million up to uh, you know, up to a billion with, uh, you know, with potential pipes and, and equity, uh, you know, roll in. The uh, march forward, you know, with some of the companies we mentioned that are more of the uh, traditional PE type buy and builds, again, you need the the larger upfront platform size, but but we've already seen some of those SPACs and the, and the and the IPOs that I mentioned in that table have done tuck-ins, you know, uh, rapidly after uh, after becoming uh, public. So, uh, you know, the typical, you know, say fifty million dollar enterprise value situation that some of our clients might find themselves in would be more of a target to uh, to merge to with a a, a post public platform company. And I think that's where I'll drop it. Well, good. Okay, and uh, and so another question that has uh, has come through is uh, uh, generally our valuations of agricultural producers increasing, uh, steady or declining, and uh, and and again, maybe I'll address this from a United States perspective, and then maybe we'll get uh, some of our, our our other experts here to chime in in their geographic areas. Um, I can I can say if you're an attractive business, uh, as defined by what what I mentioned earlier, um, as far as uh, um, you know size and strong management team and high value crops, um, it, it, it's really a, a seller's market. Uh, but you have to have everything, um, and if you if you don't, uh, then it's kind of like a barbell where uh, where if you, there's a deficiency that. Um, that uh, you would be rewarded for um, for for going ahead and mitigating that and uh, and, and addressing um, whatever the weaknesses in the in, in the in the business. Um, th- does anyone else want to want to weigh in on, um, on on their geographic area? Yeah, I think what what we what we see in Europe is that uh, in general pricing is just slightly lower than. Uh, one and a half two two years ago, but what we see is that the the best assets are uh, extra hot, are uh, yeah valued uh, abnormally high, and the files with well that, that have hairs in the soup so to say um, have more difficulties. And um, I also saw a question. On, on the split between financial and strategic buyers at the moment, since uh, uh, yeah, 12, 12 months I have the data here, we see private equity buyers uh, paying on average more than uh, than strategic buyers. Of course, varies per segment, but uh, in general, that's the case uh, in agriculture. Uh, private equity is really eager at the moment. Great. Okay. Back, and if I can go ahead. Yes, from LATAM, in terms of multiples, I would say that clearly depends on, 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 on the majority of the location of the assets per country, but I can say a range in terms of a bit of multiples between six to eight. Clearly, for example, it is more related to, to Brazil. It's going to be in the upper high, and it is more related, for example, to Argentina, it has much more volatility to six times. And in terms of, of strategic uh, vis-a-vis 
uh, financial buyers. Clearly, uh, there is a premium uh, paying by uh, strategic players, I would say, between uh, one to three notches. Yeah, I just wanted to add from uh, Africa's perspective uh, and Morocco as well. Uh, one one element that is important in valuations is uh, actually the water availability, uh, of course, which is uh, linked to the location of the land and the aggregation system uh, as well. And of course, as uh, as you said, Doug, same here. Uh, it will depend on the crop, the uh, export potential, and the uh, the value that you can bring to, to the producer. So, excellent. Well, I, I think uh, we're, we're almost out of time. And so um, we want to stay on schedule. And, and maybe uh, what I'll do is uh, kick it over to Peter if you want to do the closing remarks. Sure. Thank, thanks, Doug. And uh, so it just remains uh, for me to to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. I think in total we had about 150 uh, registrations, which is fantastic, uh, and, I, and I sincerely hope that everyone uh, has taken away some, some useful insights uh, from our presenters today, and thank you to, to our presenters. Uh, so, so hopefully we can repeat um, this, this concept, this webinar at some stage in the future, uh, but until that time, uh, I wish everyone a great success in their respective businesses. So thank you, everyone.